Greetings from Cooperstown, New York, side of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. And we're glad you could join us for the latest installment of our virtual Voices of the Game series. Beautiful day here in Cooperstown. Beautiful day in the education offices as well. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Bruce Markison. I've been uh, working uh, at the Hall in the education departments since 2013. And today we're very glad to have with us uh, really a standout major league player, great defensive middle infielder, uh, one of the best defensive second basemen of his era. He was a two-time Gold Glove Award winner, uh, was a member of the 2004 world champion Boston Red Sox. And he's also going to be coming to town Memorial Day weekend. It'll be Saturday, May 27th. He'll participate in this year's Legends game, the Hall of Fame Classic, which has become an annual event in the spring here in Cooperstown. So we welcome to the Hall of Fame Airwaves, Pokey Reese. Pokey, very glad to have a chance to talk to you. How are you doing? I'm doing good, Bruce. Thanks for having me. People are going to see you for the first time in a while with the beard, a little bit of a different look than when you played. Uh, but right. you said that the beard will be gone by Memorial Day weekend. Yeah, I like to clean it up a little. I like to look a little bit professional, you know. I mean, I'm sitting around the house chasing my one-year-old, and, man, I don't really have time to do anything, so I just let the hair grow out. Yeah, yeah. Is this your first child? No, this is my fifth child. Fifth? Wow. But it's always exciting, right? Yes, it yeah. is. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Pokey, let's, um, let's talk about your career, but... I want to go back to the early days, and I know it, it can't be easy to talk about because your upbringing was very difficult in a lot of ways. Uh, you grew up in Columbia, South Carolina. You lived uh, as a child in uh, basically a two-room structure. There was an outhouse for a bathroom. You had eight or nine relatives living in this very small home on the south end of Columbia. Uh, Tell us about what it was like. I mean, how difficult was it for you to get through those childhood years? Childhood can be very difficult under, you know, even much better circumstances. Obviously, the situation you were dealing with was uh, a little more strenuous. Yeah, I mean, I mean, as I look back on it now, I'm thankful. I mean, I was blessed. Uh, as a child, you don't even, you know, you don't even think about things like that. When Christmas came around, we had Christmas toys. When Thanksgiving came around, we had food. You know, all the holidays, family came together. Uh, and, and, and I enjoyed it. And it made me who I am today. So a strong, a strong young man, an older man now. But yeah, but I mean, I, I you know, as a kid, you don't even think about things like that. You just go out and we had we could go outside. We go outside and play and stay out all day and play baseball, football, run up and down the dirt road. And when it's time to come in, it's time to come in. But we ate, we had food, we had toys, we had clothes on our back. So, I mean, we were blessed. My understanding is your, your father uh, struggled with alcoholism. He wasn't always around. Uh, your mother pretty much raised you? Yeah, my mother, grandmother, uncle, we were raised in a village. You know, all the people around the community, you know, back then, it's totally different today. Back then, you could you, you uh, get in trouble outside and the neighbor could spank you, you know, and that, you know, like I said, and that's what made me the person who I am today. Nowadays, it's totally different. You must not have had a lot of luxuries. Uh, I know you were not able to buy uh, baseball equipment. You weren't able to get your first glove until I think you were in high school. That part must have been difficult. Uh, like I said, I mean, I as a kid, I didn't even think about none of that stuff. As long as I had something to go out there and play with, most of the time we didn't even, in the yard, we didn't even play with the glove. You know, we just had a, mm. a stick or, you know, something we could swing the bat with. So, I mean, we didn't worry about those things. We didn't have them, so we didn't worry about those things. We, just, we were just outside having, having good times as kids. Yeah, it was what you knew from the start, and you had really, I guess, nothing to compare to at right. that point. Pokey, how did your interest in baseball begin? Was it somebody in your family? Was it just something your friends liked to do? How did you become interested in playing the game? Well, my dad was a player. He played. Uh, Played around the, you know, the league. He was a great player in high school. You know what I mean? And my brothers played. My uncles all played. So it was in the blood. My mother uh, was an athlete. She ran track. So, you know, it was pretty much in the blood. And I think I was playing in the womb. 
obviously you had to put hard work in, but did you feel like baseball came naturally to you? Yeah, yes, it did. Yes, it did. Baseball and I also played football. It all came natural because that's what we did. When we went outside to play, we picked up a football, we picked up a baseball. What position you play in football? I was a quarterback. I was a receiver up to my senior year. Then I moved to a quarterback. Really? Were you good? Yeah, I was pretty good. I had a scholarship offers from, you know, Arizona State, you know, South Carolina, Clemson, you know, uh, those those teams. But I guess a lot of people knew that I probably was going to sign the baseball contract out of high school. So mm. you were better in baseball, I assume. What position did you play in baseball? I came up as a shortstop. Yeah. And if you can play shortstop, it seems that you could you can pretty much transition to just about any other position on the field. Yeah, shortstop is one of the, you know one of the key uh, positions on the field. Up the middle, it starts up the middle. So I tell these kids today, I, I, I know every position on this field. So whatever you try to tell me, it really doesn't matter. I mean, shortstop, second base, center field, catcher. Yeah, those are the main positions. But yeah, yeah. Really, if you play shortstop, you can play anywhere. Okay, tell us about getting that first glove. That can be a, a really important experience for a young boy. Uh, I remember my first glove was in the 1970s, and it was a Joe Rudy model glove. Joe Rudy was part of that Oakland A's dynasty in the early 70s, and he was already one of my favorite players. I had a chance to get his glove, so that was a real thrill. It was his signature on it, a facsimile signature, but still it had his autograph. Uh, do you remember a lot about your first glove that you owned? I really don't remember a lot about that first glove. I know in Little League, the, the coaches would, you know, have gloves, extra gloves in the bag. I'll just get pick up a glove and and actually, you know, use it. But in high school, I actually got my first glove. Don't remember a lot about it, but I know it, it worked pretty good for me. Obviously, you love playing the game, but were you a fan of Major League Baseball? Did you follow teams? Did you follow certain players? Well, I... Growing up in Columbia, South Carolina, we didn't have a professional team. So my great granddad would sit on the porch and listen to the Atlanta Braves. So, and I think that's why I'm not, not a big Brave fan today, because he would force me to listen to the game. So in Little League, my team was the Pittsburgh Pirates because our Little League uniforms were exactly like the Pittsburgh Pirates with the circle around the head, the black and gold. So the Pirates was my team, Bill Madlock. Uh, Kent to Kobe, you know, Pops, you know what I mean? So I came up liking the Pirates, but as I got older and playing shortstop the way I played it, people started comparing me to Ozzie Smith. So that's, that was, that became my favorite, uh, favorite player. You mentioned some great players with the Pirates, Bill Madlock, four-time batting champion, Willie Stargell, Hall of Famer. Was there one guy who you really liked more than the others? Well, as as I got older and I continued to follow the Pirates, it was the Killer Bees. It was Bonds, Bonilla, and Van Slyke. They were my favorite favorite player. But Barry Bonds was he became my favorite as as I liked the Pirates. Yeah, you mentioned the Ozzy Smith comparison. That had to feel good when people mentioned you in the same breath with him. Oh man, it's great just to be. It's an honor just to be in the same breath as Ozzy Smith, a Hall of Famer. I didn't even come close to. The player he became, he was. So, I mean, it definitely was an honor. Yeah. I was watching some clips of you earlier today on YouTube, and uh, I can't remember who the broadcaster or person was who was saying it, but you were a rookie uh, with the Reds at the time, 1997. Mm -hmm. So you were at second base. Barry Larkin was at shortstop. Of course, Barry Larkin, great player, Hall of Famer. Yeah. But the announcer said, uh, Pokey Reese is actually the best shortstop on this team. He just has to play second base because of Barry Larkin being there at shortstop. Uh, did you hear that sort of thing? Yes, I, I actually heard it. Yeah, I've seen that clip on YouTube, and I mean, I, I really appreciate that. Barry, was he's a brother to me. And I mean, he's he, he is Cincinnati. You know, he's Mr. Cincinnati, grew up in Cincinnati, went to Moeller, you know, Hall of Famer. And it, it's just an honor to, for someone to even uh, say that. Yeah. I want to talk more about Larkin in a moment, but let's let's discuss 1991. That's when you're taken in the first round by the Cincinnati Reds. So you're one of the best amateur players in the country. You're one of the top prospects. When you heard that you were taken in the first round, did you think to yourself, 
this is really going to be my ticket to a different life from here on in. Yeah. I mean, as a player in high school, I was just out there playing, you know, had no idea what was going on. I just loved the game and uh, scouts would come up and, you know, you have a chance, you may get drafted, blah, blah, blah. And I'm, I'm like, okay, I'm just continuing to play. And then when that day comes, I mean, it, it was one of the best days of my life. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sir. It was awesome. So you were surprised. You you maybe didn't know how good you were. Right. I was definitely surprised. Like I said, I was a, I graduated. I was 150, 55 pounds. I mean, it wasn't thinking about, you know, draft. The scouts would come around. You'd work out. You know, they'd keep you out of practice. You'd work out. But, I mean, I had no idea until that, that call came through. Yeah. I've heard a story or read a story, and maybe you can confirm whether it's true or not. A lot of the scouts were coming out to see uh, your team play, but actually they were coming out to see another player, a guy named Earl Cunningham. Mm -hmm. And that's not a name known today, but he was a highly touted high school player. I believe he was the first pick overall or close to the first pick overall. He was really the guy that everybody was coming out to see, but then coming out to see him, they noticed you. Is that true? Yes, that's a true story. We were playing those guys. They were a uh, conference rival. I mean, he six, I think it was six, four, 220 or something like that, a senior in high school. And uh, he, I mean, he would hit it and he hit a line, screaming line drive up the middle. And I just laid out and I caught the ball and made the play. Yeah. Uh, Dolby caught the ball. And then after the game, I think it was the Dodger scout was the first scout that ever came up to me and my parents. And he passed, he passed out a card and was like, you know, we're going to be coming back around. The kid, you know, he, he looked like he had fun out there playing the game. And it was all downhill from there. Yeah. Yeah. Cunningham was phenomenal in high school. And as it turned out, he never played a day in the major leagues, which tells you that scouting and baseball, these are very much inexact sciences. Are you surprised that Cunningham didn't make it? I was very surprised. I mean, he didn't, I think he didn't make it past a ball. I think the highest he got was high a ball somewhere in there. He's a right. He's a friend of mine on our Facebook still. Oh, really? But yeah, he, he didn't, he never panned out. And I was very surprised. Yeah. Well, it's great that you're able to keep in touch with him. Mm -hmm. Here's something that maybe is not that known about you. You played a long time in the minor leagues, even though you were a first round draft choice, Mm -hmm. you played seven seasons at various levels of minor league ball before you finally made your debut for the Reds in 1997. Did at any point, Pokey, during that seven-year span, did you think, hey, this isn't going to happen. I need to start thinking about doing something else. Never, never, never gave up. Never gave up. When I got drafted, it was, you know, like I said, it it was a blessing. And why why give up on something? Something's going to change. Something's going to click. I mean, and I never, I never once had doubt. I mean, injuries, I knew who I had in front of me at second, at short, at third. So I knew the path was going to be, it's going to take a while. And I was a soft hitting, I wasn't the best hitter, you know, I could field, and, but I knew one day it would come through. If not with the Reds, it would be some somebody else watching. That's why you never take it for granted. You go out and work hard and take your ground balls and get your work in. Someone, it only takes one. Yeah. <laughs> Was it a case of you were just slow to develop as a hitter or was there just so much talent in that Reds organization? I believe that Ron Oster was the, may have been the second baseman at one point at that time. Was there just so much talent around you, both in the farm system and the major league level that that slowed your progress? I mean, I'm sure it has something to do with it, but like I said, I, you know, they want to see you perform and, you know, like I came in as a de- defensive player. I wasn't the best hitter. You know, as I got older and played those games in mind, I became a better hitter. So I guess they wanted to see me perform with the bat a little more. And then, like you said, you had Larkin, you had Boone, you had Willie Green. You know, you had a lot of good players in front of me. You know, Brian Kaling, you know, Jeff Brans- Branson, you know, all those players. So, you know, you just got to wait your turn. And that's what I did. Yeah, there was some talent there. Let's go to our first question. It's from Ryan Homestead. And this really leads in perfectly to what I wanted to bring up next. Ryan writes, I always enjoy hearing about the moment players get called up. Uh, How was that news delivered to you in 1997? What was that first 24 hours like? 
leading up to making your major league debut? Uh, it was it was uh, Dave Miley was my manager in AAA, and after the game, he called me in, and you know how they how they normally do it. He just said, you know, you you got the call, go up there and, and don't I don't want to see you back here. So that's what I did. I was in Indianapolis, so I didn't have to drive too far over. Got on the phone, called my mom's up, and you know, told her to get on the flight and meet me in Cincinnati. And that's, that's what I did. Were you nervous in the car and then on the plane? Uh, a little nervous. I, I mean, yeah, I was nervous. I mean, it's my first time in the big stadium, the big bright lights, the triple decker, you know, stadium, you know, it, 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 it was unbelievable getting out there and you're looking up and you're amazed how big this place is, you know, in AAA in the minors, you don't play in, you know, fields, anything close to what the majors are but yeah, yeah it, it was exciting did you get to play that first night I did I think I did play that I think I started that first game and I got the game winning hit in 97 wow I think it was off Rick Helling yeah it was off Rick Helling okay a little blooper down the first base line but he got the job done so you played second base Larkin was a short no I played shortstop I think Larkin was hurt at the time oh okay he ended up, he ended up getting hurt yeah so you got to play your original position. Uh, I assume you handled all the plays flawlessly, and then you pick up the game-winning hit. What a day. Yeah. yeah. Next day, I think I faced Air Light, and I hit my first home run. So it was a pretty pretty impressive first two games. Yeah. Well, that's that's a tremendous start and had to be so satisfying yes. Uh, yes. after that seven years. Because so many guys will will end up quitting. They just can't make it financially. They might have a family to support at a young age. Or some guys get released. Some guys like an Earl Cunningham just don't advance, don't progress the way they're expected to. But you did it in 1997. Uh, another great moment, I was watching this on YouTube earlier today. It's an extra inning game. I believe it's against the Cardinals. And you hit a walk-off home run in extras against Ricky Batalico. Yeah. You must remember that day. Oh, oh, without a doubt. Yeah, Ricky, uh, Ricky was a hell of a pitcher himself. So uh, we were down. I think we were in a pennant race at the time, so it made it even special. I mean, first pitch, he hung a slide. I think it was either a cutter or a little slider that he was just trying to get me over. And I was like, man, if you throw this ball over pitch, just take a hack at it and see what happens. I wasn't expecting it to go, you know, be a double. It, it actually cleared the fence. I mean, we ended up staying, winning the game and, Standing in that race against the Astros that year, 99, yeah. After the home run, the entire team comes out of the dugout, mm -hmm. and it, it almost had a playoff feel, the way the celebration was going. But what I thought was really special was after that, you went over and high-fived every member of the Reds' grounds crew. I thought oh, that was man. terrific. Yeah, those are our friends, man. They, they took, care of, took care of that turf for us, and, I mean – we would actually, you know, before the game or after the game, we'd hang out with those guys, man. They were a part of the team, too. So it, we would go in and out that way. Some of us would go down through the dugout, but most of us would just go right behind the, you know, the uh, catcher and go go to the clubhouse that way. And so they would all be there. They would do that every game. We win. They would come in, shake our hand, win or lose. They'd yeah. shake our hand. Those guys, I keep in touch with a lot of those guys to this day. Well, based on their facial expressions, I mean, they were thrilled. I could tell they all liked you and were friends with you. Yeah, we. Were, I mean, like I said, I, I didn't. I'm a per type of person. I don't hate no one. So all those guys are my friends, and you know, I appreciated what they did for us to keep that field intact. It was turf, but they had to, you know, keep the dirt and all that stuff intact as well. Yeah. Pokey, in those early years with the Reds, uh, were there mentors either among the coaches, the manager? players that really served as mentors to you that that gave you advice uh, helped you work through the difficult games the difficult times mm -hmm. i imagine larkin was one but i'm sure there were others too correct yes uh, reggie sanders comes to mind uh, he's from florence south carolina not far from me so i mean that was the you know we had that in common larkin larkin wouldn't say much but when he was out there taking his ground balls you better believe i was the second in line Watching, you know, watching what he does. Uh, Brett Boone, Mark Lewis uh, hmm. gave me the best advice I could get as a second baseman. So we were out there taking ground balls one day. He's like, come here, a Pope. So I went over. He's like, just look. So we had a hitter. He's like, look at the angle the ball comes off the bat. He said second base is one of the easiest positions to play. So I took that in mind. So 
I would get up there, it would get a hitter in that I go field ground balls and I would see the angle. If that ball is away, pretty much maybe major league hitters are going to hit the ball away. If it's in, they're pretty much going to pull the ball. So that helped me get my jumps from, you know, on the ball at second base. And I mean, that that's pretty much what helped me become the fielder I became at second base to help me win those gold gloves. I would get some of the best jumps there was as a second baseman plan, playing at second. So yeah. that was big. So he said second base was an easy position to play. Did you agree yeah. with him on that? I agree totally. Only difference playing second and third, I mean, second and short, at shortstop coming across the bag, you can see the runner. At second mm-hmm. base, you got your back or your side to the runner. You couldn't, You when you turn a double play, you can't see him. That was the only difference I had. And I didn't really struggle at that. I mean, I love the when they come in and slide. I just use the base as my protection, you know? Yeah. So that's, that's the only thing. Second base was pretty, pretty easy position to play, in my opinion. That's interesting. So you remain with the Reds through the 2001 season. And then that winter, you go through just a crazy time. You spent time on four different rosters during a span of about 45 days. Mm -hmm. Uh, You're traded to the Rockies one day. You never play for them, though, because you're then traded to the Red Sox the next day. Mm -hmm. Then it turns out you become a free agent because I guess the Red Sox didn't pick up your option for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And then you signed with the Pittsburgh Pirates. Now, granted, this wasn't during the season, so you didn't have to keep relocating, but that must have been a very frenetic and difficult time for you to deal with that. Well, I mean, I knew, you know, being in the, in the, in the game is a business. So, I mean, I can only control what I can control. So I really didn't. All I could do is continue to train and try and get stronger and get better as a player. So I really... I really didn't follow him. I had my age, my agent was on it and you know, whatever happens, he would give me a call and let me know what's going on. So, but I really just didn't not even worry about it. I was like, man, I, you, God bless me. I'll be on, I'll be on the team somewhere. Trying yeah. to make a team somewhere, you know? So you end up with the pirates, the team that you liked as a kid. How did that go for you? It went well for me. I mean, we were a young team. We didn't win much, but you know, like you said, as a kid playing for my, favorite team it, it was it was pretty awesome in that stadium and that skyline and that field that's that's the best in the league so I mean I, I enjoyed my time in Pittsburgh beautiful place to play and you know met a lot of good friends there the team we didn't win a lot but you know you had some good guys on the team great guys on the team we were real young you know I haven't been to PNC Park which I could kick myself for but I have talked to so many players and fans who have said and, and even some who've only been there once. Mm-hmm. They've said that's the best ballpark they've ever seen. It is. Well, yeah, it is top top three for me. Yeah. How was the infield? Was it, it was, was it was it good to field on? Yeah, the, the grass was kind of thick. You know, it slows the ball down, but and the, it was a lot of dirt, which I didn't I didn't like. You know, the grass was cut short, so you had more dirt to to play on. I didn't really like that too much, but I adjusted. You know, you just have to adjust to the situation. You told me earlier that you, you aren't necessarily a big fan of baseball history, mm-hmm. but you're coming in at a position where the Pirates had a long run of really good second basemen. They had Jose Leend right. in the 1980s, great fielder. Mm-hmm. Uh, players like Rennie Stennett, Dave Cash, who was part of their 1971 World Championship team. And then before that, Hall of Famer Bill Mazeroski. Right. Uh, was that something you were aware of or you didn't really know about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I knew about I knew about it. I mean, Bill, of course, I knew uh, Mr. Mazeroski. I mean, he was a, uh, he hit the game, game winning home run in game seven. So I definitely knew about that. And he would come around. So, you know, I knew about, I knew about Jose Lean, Chico Lean. He was one of my favorites as well on that Pirates team. Yes. Oh, my, yeah. No doubt. So you talked to Maz. Did he ever give you advice? Well, he didn't, I mean, he didn't give me too much advice, but yes, we spoke and he, we, we, you know, he, we talked and people let, you know, uh, walkie Bob Walk was our TV uh, play-by-play play announcer, and he, you know, would tell me, you know, how Bill was big in the community and how people loved him. And I have a big, feel, big shoes to fill, so you know, they would let me know. Yeah. Um, how about Dave Cash? You ever meet Dave? No, I have never met Mr. Cash. Yeah, he's. Uh, I got to know him. I used to work in Utica at a radio station, okay. and Dave was actually from Utica. Mm -hmm. Uh, He goes back there occasionally. Um, He was a a great college uh, or great high school basketball player. 
Um, but he wasn't able to make the academic grade at Syracuse to play basketball. And then he ended up playing baseball. And that turned out really well as he became a, a very fine player for the the Pirates, the Phillies, the Expos during a, a very long career. So you're with the Pirates for a few seasons. And then 2004, you sign with the Red Sox. Why yeah. Boston? Uh, I always wanted to play. Me and Manny Ramirez came out in the same year. He was the 13th pick that year. I was the 20th pick. Played against him in the minor league. So I always wanted to play with him. I always wanted to play behind Pedro. And I knew, you know, Schilling was coming on the team. And I knew we had a chance to win. It was it was out of the Red Sox or the Yankees that year. And I chose the Red Sox because the Yankees had the, you know, I, I had my braids. You know, they they, they had to be clean shaven in, in New York. And I didn't really want to, you know, shave my, you know, cut my braids. So I was like, man, I'm going to go ahead and I want to go play with Manny anyway. And boom, yeah. there it was. And I played against Frank Kona in the minor leagues. He was in Birmingham. When I was in Chattanooga, and he was, I, I, I knew uh, Frank Kona, so I always wanted to. He was, a, he he was a great manager, and I always wanted to play play for him as well. Yeah, that's always a consideration with the Yankees. Are you um, you're willing to give up the beard or the long hair, or something that might not be considered conservative hairstyle? Right. Uh, but in Boston, they obviously didn't care about that. I want to ask anything? you, Pokey, about playing at Fenway Park. It's um, it's such a great place to watch a game. Uh, the games are always interesting. You're never out of it because of that short left field wall, even though it's rather high. What about playing there? Is it as much fun to play there as it is to watch a game? 38,000 every night screaming for you, uh, screaming for the team. You know, I mean, what more do you want? I mean, like you said, you're never out of the game. Those people are so in tune into the game. I mean, it's unbelievable. Every pitch, they on top of it. So, I enjoyed it. I mean, like I said, I keep saying I was blessed. I was really blessed to, to be a part of that organization and that team. And I, I enjoyed every minute of it. How'd the fans treat you there? They were great. They were great. I mean, when Nomar went down, I stepped in, I uh, played shortstop, and uh, they were they they loved it. I mean, you know, they had some bumper stickers. Pokey would have had it. So, you know, I mean, they, they were great. I mean, I enjoyed every minute of it. Beautiful. You know, we've heard stories and we talked to Adam Jones. Uh, he was one of our guests earlier this spring. Mm -hmm. And he talked about, you know, some of the racial problems that he faced from some of the fans there. And hasn't always been easy for black players in Boston. Mm -hmm. That didn't really happen to you, though. No, I, I didn't. I didn't really hang out much. I didn't really, you know, do too much. I mean, I just show up at the field and play. So. They, I mean, I didn't, I didn't come across any of that. I mean, yeah. I've heard, from, I've heard it from some of the players who played there that it was like that, but I never, never, ever once had that problem. Is there a lot of pressure in Boston on any player, black or white, just because of the tradition there? The fans are known for being pretty demanding. They call into the talk shows when the team's not playing well. Did you feel a lot of pressure from the fans there? My pressure, I feel pressure comes from within, so I didn't. I didn't feel any pressure playing there. I mean, not at all. I mean, as long as you win and you plan, you plan, you're doing your job, those people love you. I did my job, so they love me. Our guest is Pokey Reese, uh, former Major League standout for the Reds, Pirates, and Red Sox. Uh, we're going to talk uh, about a few other items, including the upcoming Hall of Fame Classic as we continue our conversation but Pokey, let's stick with that 2004 season. You're playing against the uh, hated Yankees mm -hmm. in the ALCS. Uh, you're down three nothing. Not only down three nothing, but you really you kind of been blown out in the games. Mm -hmm. And then over the next four games, we see this transformation. What was that like going through that? Did it seem surreal? Did it seem like this is just not possible? I. Uh, yeah. Anything's possible. That's what we were saying in the dugout in, in the locker room. Go out and win the next game. Cliche, but go out and win the next game. And don't think about, you know, nothing else but the next game. And that's what the leaders were saying. Malar, Veritek, you know, Schilling, just win the next game. And and we did, and the rest is history. <laughs> yeah. At what point during that comeback did you think? We're going to win this darn thing. Was it after game four, game five, what? Uh, I'd say 
after that, I think it was game six. I mean, we beat them. We're going in, I think going into game seven, I mean, confidence was high. I mean, yeah. we got within three, three games to two or three games, three games to three. We were like, man, anything can happen. Let's go out and put our best foot, best foot forward. And man, we did. And we never, like I said, we never gave up. Everybody was positive. I mean, you know, 3-0 against the Yankees, you don't usually see that happen. But I mean, I guess it was it, it was our it was our year. Yeah. Well, it's, it's never happened in major league history before or since in, in a best of seven format. Uh, it's happened occasionally in other sports like the NHL. I think it's happened in the NBA once or twice, uh, but that's the only time in Major League Baseball. What did it mean to you, Pokey, to have a chance to field the final out and throw to first base to cap off that remarkable comeback? Hey, I was wanting that ball. I was wanting that play. Hit it to me, man. Let me, let's get this thing over with. It was unbelievable. Alan Embry, uh, Ruben Sierra. Threw him a, I think it was a cutter or whatever, fastball way, and he squibbed it to me. It wasn't hit hard at all. I was telling myself, we will not miss this ball. You yeah. will stay down on this ball, and you will step and throw and hit McCavage in the chest, and that's what I did, and it was one of the best feelings ever. Now, it's interesting you see that, because I have to think some players, maybe guys that are not good defensive players like you were, they're maybe praying, don't hit the ball to me. Nah. But you had the opposite reaction. Yeah, I mean, when you don't want the ball, that's when the ball is going to find you. So, you know, if you believe in yourself and trust in your, you, you know, your work, I mean, you want every play. I wanted every ball. I wanted to chase every fly ball, shallow fly ball. I wanted to make every play. And that's how that's how I played the game. Yeah. As soon as that ground ball was hit by Ruben Sierra, you thought, I got this easy. Oh, it's over. Hey, let's <laughs> it's time to get in there and pop the champagne. Yeah. <laughs> And then you go on to the World Series, um, and, of course, the Red Sox end that incredibly uh, long drought of postseason frustration. Uh, this was your first um, world championship as a, as a player, a professional player. Um, I would think that it has to be an exhilarating feeling. Um, to me, it would be even greater than winning an MVP. Maybe the only thing that's been better is making the Hall of Fame. But in terms of, of what you want to do as a team, I mean, that's the ultimate. And it, it just must have been an awesome feeling for you. Yeah, it was a great feeling. It's a team game, and you win it with the 24 of the guys, you know, on the roster. It was, it was a great feeling. My mom was in the stand. So, I mean, it was an even better feeling. Everything I've read about that team, you had some colorful characters, you had some some interesting people like Manny Ramirez, but it seems like for the most part, everybody got along. Yeah, yeah, we did. Uh, we had a, we were struggling early in the year, you know, we had a team dinner, you know, everybody would, you know, all the captains would talk, I didn't, you know, I didn't, I'm not a talker, so I just listened and we were like, man, we got 25 calves, 25 players, 25 calves, we have to change that. And when we changed that, that's when everything started coming together. So you, in any sport, you got to come together as one. Early in the year, we wasn't. We were doing our own thing. And, man, when you get together as a team, any, you, know, you can achieve anything. And that's what happened. And we went on a roll, and we started winning. And like I said, the rest is history. So you're at the peak of the world there in baseball. You've won your first world championship. You were a key contributor during the second half, played some shortstop, played some second base. But then you end up retiring. You don't play again, either in the majors or the minors, I believe, after that. Uh, why the decision to retire? Did you feel like nobody was interested in you, or had you just lost some desire to play? Well, I did try to come back in 07, 08 with the Nationals. I was in AAA with the Nationals for a while, and my hamstrings didn't allow it, so I had I just go ahead, went ahead and gave it up. But, yeah, I mean – you know, you're living out your suitcase. I lost a lot of interest in the game. I was leaving. I left the Reds. I started feeling I lo I'm losing my friends. You know what I mean? I, hmm. Don Casey, Demetri Young, Mike Cameron, Aaron Boone, Barry Larkin. You know, you're so close to those guys. And then you get to switching teams. You go to teams. I mean, you you make friends on other teams. But, man, you your brother, those were my brothers. I came up with those guys, you know. And I just lost the love of the game. And I just felt it was time. I was told when you're not having fun in something, it's time mm -hmm. to it's time to get out of it before you get hurt or get somebody else hurt. And I just I just didn't feel it anymore. And I, you know, I decided to, you know, 
my agent was trying to keep me in there, but you know, that's their job to yeah. keep me playing so they could, you know, get paid. But I, I just <laughs> told myself, man, I'm gonna go ahead and I I had I was hurt in Pittsburgh in 03. I think I tore my thumb up, my other thumb. And I, I I was at home one day and I just got on my knees and prayed. And I was like, Lord, if I ever get a chance to get on a team to win the World Series, I'm gonna call it quiz. And the next year it was 04, and I got on that team with the Red Sox and I won that World Series. And I, you know, I couldn't, I had to keep my promise, you know what I mean? So I, yeah. I and I did lose, I, I did lose it. I didn't want to, I didn't feel it anymore. So it was time to go. So you were 31, you still had athletic ability and uh, almost certainly would have made a team, but you made that decision to retire. Mm -hmm. uh, but then you did come back a couple of years later and you were in the minor league system of the Nationals. Mm -hmm. Did you feel by then that the two-year layoff that had cost you a lot in terms of what you could do? You know, as an athlete, you never think it's over, but your body says otherwise. You know, like I said, my hamstrings, you know, I wasn't getting the same treatment every day. You know, you're trying to come back. You got a hamstring, man. You got to treat that thing. I wasn't getting the, the treatment, and I kept just pulling the hamstring. And I was like, man, this ain't going to work. Yeah. So I decided, you know, really go ahead and lay it down. Go ahead and step away. Uh, let these younger guys come up and, you know, have their glory. Get out of the way. Pokey, here at the Hall of Fame, we uh, have something called the Black Baseball Initiative, which we actually started last year. Mm -hmm. and it's um, kind of revved up this year. It's going to culminate in a new exhibit about Black baseball history in the spring of 2024. Um, there's already articles appearing at our, our, our website. I recently wrote about Doc Ellis, who used to pitch for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Mm -hmm. uh, there are going to be educational uh, efforts. Uh, here on the screen, you see um, kind of a division of our website, the Black Baseball Initiative, which is all about this. Uh, there will be a book, but it's all really going to culminate next year when uh, our new exhibit, which is going to be spectacular, when that does finally open. You were telling me that you're maybe not as into the history of baseball as, as some others would be, but I would still think you maybe would like to see something in particular come out of this exhibit. Uh, maybe something related to the time that you played. You played in the 90s and the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. And although there wasn't as much racism at that time as there was in the era of Jackie Robinson and in the 1950s and 60s, there were still problems. There were still difficulties. Is, is there anything in particular, uh, a personal story or something about baseball from your era, Black baseball from your era, that you'd like to see conveyed in this effort? Uh, I mean, you know, like when we played when I in the 90s and 2000s, you would have five or six uh, black players on a team, you know what I mean? Nowadays, the only thing I would like to see is more, you know, young black uh, players get a chance to, you know, play in the game. That's my only thing I have, I mean, I'm sure, I mean, I know there's a lot of talent out there. I mean, just they just need the shot to play. Black managers, black GMs, but you know, black bench coaches, give us a chance. I would love, I would love one day to get back into the game. You know what I mean? I'm gonna go, I'm gonna come up there and hopefully I can talk to some of the guys. I think Junior Spivey will be there. I think he's coaching or doing something in baseball. I'm gonna I'm gonna sit down with him and talk and see how I can get back into hmm. the game, you know, and try try and get on one of these coaching staffs. I know you have to go take your steps, go through the minors. And I, I, I totally understand that, but like I had to do that to become a professional player. So hopefully one day I can, you know, get back in the game, but that's the only thing I'd like to see just more black players in the game. You mentioned before we went on the air that you're doing some public relations work for the Reds. You've appeared at fantasy camps and, and that sort of thing. And um, as you say, hopefully you'll, have an opportunity to do some coaching. You certainly have enthusiasm and love for the game. I think that's that's pretty obvious. What do you think, if anything, baseball can do to get more black players? They've tried the RBI program, reviving baseball in the inner city. Um, they've they've tried some outreach. Uh, we've had baseball ambassadors like Jim Mudcat Grant, Buck O'Neill, sadly, both of whom have passed away. Is there something we're missing? Is there something that you think baseball realistically could do in the next five, 10 years 
that might result in at least a few more black players coming into the game. Yeah, you have a lot of uh, players, uh, you know, in these cities and all these cities around uh, America, the country, like they, they, they develop these camps in Dominican. You know, you got every baseball team, I think, has a camp in Dominican. Why not build the baseball camps here in America to get these kids to play? I mean, everybody can't be Michael Jordan. Everybody can't be, you know, a football player. You know, you, baseball is an outlet. Jose Altuve is five foot seven and won an MVP. It's hard to do that in football and basketball unless you Allen Iverson or someone. Football is, is out, out of the question. So baseball is a is a great outlet for these kids. It's not about your size. It's about your heart. So I think if they put the money, time and effort in building academies here in America, you know, you get these kids out, you know, get them, teach them Spanish, just like they teach the, the uh, Latin players English, teach these guys Spanish because you're going to eventually be on the team with a bunch of Latin players. Why not mm-hmm. give it? Why not give it a shot? I mean, that's that's one thing I think they could do. I mean, I would love to be a part of that. I mean, that that would be great to get these kids into that because uh, around here, everybody want to be Michael Jordan. You, you, it's not going to happen. I mean, I try and tell them that you know, me and my, my well, my wife is a big ambassador around here, trying to get these kids. We started up our little league back here three years ago. It, it's coming around, but you know, you got the kids that want to go in the gym. Uh, you hear it's too hot. Baseball's boring. You know, it's long. Well, yeah, but the payoff is big. So, I mean, that's yeah. what we try, try and teach these kids around here. We see so many of the best athletes, black athletes, going to uh, the NBA, uh, the NFL, maybe to a lesser extent boxing, although I think maybe that's not as prominent a sport as it once was. Um, you make some great points about baseball being more universal you know you don't have to be six foot four Mm -hmm. you don't have to weigh 250 pounds we Mm -hmm. see players of all different sizes we see hall of famers phil rizzuto was barely five foot six you mentioned jose altuve could very well make the hall of fame he's probably shorter than rizzuto was Mm -hmm. um we we see um some pitchers who aren't quote unquote great athletes they don't necessarily have great speed but they have an understanding of how to pitch and that's one of the great things about it. I think also maybe another thing is promoting the fact that if you do make it in professional baseball, you can have a longer career, certainly a longer career than the NFL uh, and very possibly a longer career than in the NBA. Mm-hmm. And if you ever do reach the top of your sport, you're going to make more money than any of these other sports. So it's guaranteed. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the NFL contracts are only partially guaranteed. Major League contracts are fully guaranteed. So maybe that's part of the answer uh, as well. Um, what, and a, what lot of these country- kids, a lot of these kids, they see you go straight from college to the NBA or straight from college to the NFL. They don't they don't understand the fact that, you know, you have minor leagues. You got to like I said, I played seven years. A lot of them don't they can't, you know conceive that but i mean it all pays off in the end you know what i mean yeah what part of the country are you living in now i'm in hopkins south carolina right outside of columbia are there baseball camps around there where you feel like hey i could contribute to this well i throw i I mean i have a camp i had a couple camps i mean you get you get kids to come out you know we try to get them to bring proper attire some of them come out without you know, gloves without, they'll come out in jeans. So we, you know, we try to get the parents to understand we throw in the camp and we have some equipment, but we can't have all the equipment for every kid to come out and, you know, things like that. But yeah, we throw camps around here. Herm Winningham is around here. He'll come help me out in the camp. Orlando Hmm. Hudson is around here. You know, he'll have some camps down there in Darlington, South Carolina. So, you know, it's, it's guys around here that, you know, DT Cromer's around here. He'll throw some camps. He has a facility over in Lexington where he lives. So, I mean, it's, it's things that can get done around here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Have you guys ever thought about unifying into one larger camp? We have not talked about that, but I mean, me and Herm has talked about it. Yes. But, you know, guys are trying to do their own, the, trying to do their own thing. So I'm not the person to go around and, you know, I'm not a big talker. You know, my wife will get out there and, you know, but I just, I just try to stay in my lane. You know what I mean? I let them, They've been doing it a little longer than I have, you know, 
because a lot of them got out of the game before I did and they started out and they're doing great things. Don't get me wrong, but I just try to do what I can do. And if, you know, me and Herm, we'll get together and talk and do some things. But, you know, other than that, I, I try to just stay in my lane because people, yeah. you, know, you never know what people these days, it, it's tough. We have a few minutes remaining with uh, former Major League second baseman and shortstop Pokey Reese. We'd like to take as many of your questions as possible. You can post those in the chat room. In fact, we do have some questions there right now. Uh, here's a question coming in from Ryan. P uh, Pokey, what advice would you give kids playing baseball these days? Advice to kids today. I mean, just go out and do the best you can. I mean, you know, listen to your coaches. Well, first of all, listen to your parents, because if not, you're not going to be out there playing. Do, get your grades. Just just listen. Just take a second and listen. And because these coaches that's playing, uh, that's giving you the instruction, they probably played the game. So listen and, you know, keep an open mind and man, just just have fun. The game is great. Just have fun. Don't put so much pressure on yourself. This is a hard, the hardest game to play. You're trying to hit a round ball with a round bat moving all over the place. So it is a hard game. Just listen and soak it all in and, you know, be the best person you can be. And these coaches aren't getting rich. I mean, they're out there because they want to help. And right. most of them have good advice. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 they do. Question from Jay Schiffman, kind of a related question. Uh, Jay wants us to ask you, how can we support your camp? Is there anything that people can do? Well, I, I, when I come up to Cooperstown, I can can I I can probably give you the information. My wife is not here; she she has all the information. I I just do the baseball side of things, you know. Okay. So I can get information. You can send uh you can send the stuff to her email, and I mean I'm, she she'll read it and she'll you know get it to me, and I I'll, I'll look over the stuff. But yes, anything can help. I mean anything can help. And you are going to be part of the skills clinic that we're going to have on Friday night at Doubleday Field. Uh, and I think you'll be perfect for that. So that will be a good opportunity to connect with some of these kids and they can find out more about the camp uh, that you offer in uh, in your part of the country. Uh, other questions coming in uh, the chat. Uh, we've had this one waiting for a while from Steve Cheskin. Uh, you mentioned earlier about loving PNC Park in Pittsburgh, but Steve wants to know, what are two or three other favorite stadiums of yours that you played in? Dodger Stadium is number one. Uh, Wrigley Field is probably top five. Uh, San Diego, I played in uh, Jack Murphy Stadium, you know what I mean? The old, the old stadium. So it's just beautiful out there. The field was in pristine condition. So, yeah, that Houston, I love playing in Houston. So those, those are my top four or five right there. Yeah. What do you like in particular about Dodger Stadium? It's always a blue sky. The infield was fast. You know what I mean? And I just love being in L.A. I'm, I'm not a big L.A. person, but I love Dodger Stadium. I just I just love playing out there, man. Yeah. Another question coming in. Uh, in our house, four boys, all diehard Reds fans. Mm -hmm. Pokey was so popular that we named our wireless Internet Pokey Reese. Oh, wow. And this gentleman would love to support your camp if there's any kind of a fundraiser or something like that. Okay. Wow. Thank you. I mean, that's, uh, I appreciate I appreciate the support. Let's talk a little bit about the big weekend coming up here in Cooperstown. Of course, our big, big weekend is toward the end of July when we have our induction this year, Fred McGriff and uh, uh, Scott Rowland, really two players of your era, both making it to the Hall of Fame this year. Uh, but the Hall of Fame Classic, that weekend is coming up, May 26th, 27th, and 28th. The big highlight is Saturday, May 27th, 1 p.m., the Legends game that will be played at Historic Doubleday Field. It's a ballpark that is now uh, 103 years old, one of the oldest ballparks in North America. Uh, tickets are still available. People can get tickets by calling 407-564-8059. And you can also visit the website. We'll leave that link up there for a while if people would like to jot that down. So you've got this game coming up. Uh, have you played at Double Day before? No, I have not. No, I have not. I was watching a league of their own last the other night, and I seen Double Day you know, double day feel. I'm like, wow, I, I will be there in a couple of weeks. 
it's um, it's pretty favorable for uh, anybody who can get the ball in the air about mm-hmm. 250 to 300 feet. Oh, wow. So um, uh, people have been known to hit two, three home runs a day there. There's also a home run derby uh, that uh, takes place. So this is your first visit to Cooperstown ever. Ever, ever. Wow. We got to get you up here. Yeah, I was uh, my home, my friend. I got a friend who lives in, uh, he played for the Red and Reds organization back in the day. He has a travel ball teams and they've been up to Cooperstown Dreams Park, you know, and I always wanted to get a team together and try and, you know, play in that tournament, but I've never been up there. He, he has been up yeah. there. Yeah. There's a lot of former major league players that coach and have um, uh, players coming up, um, uh, the, the 12-year-old uh, and under category. Uh, Dreams Park has become a huge thing, and so also is the Cooperstown uh, All Star Village, uh, okay. which is located a little further away in Oneonta. But those are uh, those are definitely uh, very strong, surging places promoting youth baseball. A mm-hmm. um, few other questions uh, that we have coming in. Uh, this one is from Cindy Pokey. What was the funniest moment from the Sox 04 experience? Uh, I had funniest. To be- it had to be when Manny, I think it was a, a line drive left center field. Manny, uh, Johnny Damon retrieves the ball, and Manny all of a sudden comes out of nowhere and cuts the ball off. I mean, you know, he's trying to get it back <laughs> to the infield. Manny just all of a sudden jumps and cuts the ball off. And I think the guy ended up hitting the horn in the park that game or something. But I, I was, it was a funny, that was the funniest moment I, I saw there in uh, Fenway. Maybe not so funny at the time. No, at all. Because <laughs> <laughs> we ended up losing that game. I think we ended up losing that game. Yeah. Uh, Pokey, a question from uh, Ted Rich. Pokey, you seem so excited to be in spring training with the Reds. When we were there for your very first spring training, this must have been sometime in the early 90s, and do you have cool. a favorite spring training moment? Oh, uh, yeah. Get, getting called, just being a caddy. For, for for Larkin, you know, being an extra, you could you you know you going over playing in big leagues games. I would I would be the caddy every away game, so I got to play a lot. Larkin would get two at bats. He'd come to me, kid, you ready? He like poke, you ready to go in? And I would end up getting four at bats. So <laughs> I wouldn't I didn't mind playing caddy. I would get you know get the exposure. I, I played well, and that probably helped me become the player I became also getting, getting, getting to play in the games a little earlier. So that was my favorite moment from uh, my early years in the minors. Very nice. A couple of questions. One from Jason Curtis. What are Pokey Reese's thoughts on the new major league rules, uh, particularly the uh, pitch clock that's been installed also rules affecting how many times hitters can call timeout and of course, the banning of the shift. Uh, your thoughts on the rules, good, bad, or indifferent? I kind of I, I kind of like the rules. I mean, speeding up the game. I, I didn't, as a player, I didn't really care, you know, but nowadays people who, you know, keep people in tune in the game, they want to speed the game up. So I, I kind of like it as far as the shift. I love that you cannot shift, makes the game. Now we see who, you know, is the athlete out there who can cover the ground they need to cover to make plays. So hmm. I, I, I love that they don't do that shift anymore. But as far as the, the pitch count, it really didn't affect me. So, I mean, I really don't really don't care about that. I don't care. We stayed out there four or five hours. long we win the game. If you <laughs> out there playing the game that you love, I don't care how long it takes, as long as you go out there and compete and win. So yeah, that, that, well, that's, that part, that's part. It's interesting because if they had shifted that extreme way when you played, there would have been other guys around you on that side of second base, and that would have limited your opportunities to make plays. Exactly. So I mean, we had turf in Cincinnati. I was already playing. This year. I was already back out in pretty much right field anyway. So I was taking away a lot of that stuff before, you know, the shift was even bought up. So, I mean, it really didn't bother me. It, make, it gave me the opportunity to make more plays, like you said. Yeah. Uh, final question coming in also from Jason. He wants to know what players do you like to watch who are playing now? Oh, today's players, I, I, Mike Trout, uh, Ronald Acuna, Jose Altuve, uh, Xander Bogarts, Rafael Devers. Uh, goodness, it, it's so many. I just love, I love watching the guy. I, I love the game, period. So I, I love them all. I mean, I want to see all of them succeed, but those those are my favorites. 
So it sounds like you really still follow the game today. Yeah, I mean, I sit down and watch the game. I watch the game every night in here. Me and my son to get back. He's one. He's already into it. So he'll sit down and I'll hold him and we'll just sit there and watch the game. He's hitting. I'm tossing him while the game is going on. He, he's screaming ball, 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 bat, bat, bat. So <laughs> man, I love it. Is there a particular team you root for today or you just like watching the games? Yeah, I root for the, the Red Sox and the Pirates and, of, of course, the Reds. Yeah, Larkin, Larkin is he does some of the play-by-play, -play, so I love hearing Larkin call the game. Yeah, yeah, that's got to be great. Uh, do you like interleague play? Love it. I love it. You get to go play in all these parks. You know, I, I love interleague play, yes. You know, I think baseball has made some great strides this year. I've I've been a critic for a long time of the slow pace of play. Uh, to me, there's nothing interesting about watching a pitcher fiddle around on the mound for 30 to 40 seconds. Right. Games are now getting completed in two hours, 20 minutes to two hours, 40 minutes, which is a lot more reasonable. And, you know, maybe the faster pace of play will do a good job in helping to recruit uh, more young players to the game, right. be they black right. players or white players. But I, I think the faster pace uh, it, it's just been a, a tremendously positive change, long overdue in my mind, but it is better late than never. And um, I think the game is headed uh, in a good direction. Pokey, we really appreciate uh, your time. You've been a lot of fun to talk to you. You have tremendous energy. And we do look forward to meeting you the weekend, May 26th, 27th, and 28th, Memorial Day weekend. You'll be at the Skills Clinic Friday evening at Doubleday Field. And then I assume you're going to be in the starting lineup for one of the two teams on Saturday afternoon. Uh, you'll have a chance to play for one of two managers. Jim Cott will manage one team. Bert Blylevin, also a Hall of Famer, will manage another. It'll be your first time in Cooperstown. And uh, we look forward to meeting you. And we hope you have a great trip and a great time here in this village. Thank you. And I can't wait. And looking forward to it. I think I may be in the Hall of Fame somewhere. I get to see myself in there. I think I'll... The 4 team stuff may be in there, so I get to I get to see that. That'll be awesome. You know, I was doing a search at our website. I know that there is a bobblehead of you. Oh, okay. From your days with the Pittsburgh Pirates. Okay, good. Uh, I wasn't able to find anything else, but um, sometimes the search is not one hundred percent up to date. So there's a possibility there's some other items. Okay. Uh, but if there are, our collections department will find out about it. And you will have a chance to look at it because you'll be offered a behind the scenes tour here at the museum. So that that'll be fun. Uh, but we do look forward to uh, meeting you. Uh, it's been a lot of fun, Pee Wee. Thanks for taking this past hour to be with us. OK, I got my, my wife uh, email is team Reese 18 at Yahoo dot com. If you want to send, you know, send something over so she can read it. And I, I'm sure she will pass it along to me. So I would that'll be really appreciative. Sure. Let me let me repeat that. T Reese. That's T R. Like team. Team Reese. T right. T. T is in team. Right. T R E E S E 18 mm -hmm. at yahoo.com. Yes, but it is spelled team like we're part of a team. Oh, team. I'm sorry. Yes. I got it. All right. So it's not just the letter T, but team. T E A M. R E E S E 18 at yahoo.com. Uh, that's contact. Uh, you can get in touch with uh, Pee Wee's wife, uh, not Pee Wee, but I knew I was going to call you Pee Wee because of Pee Wee Reese. Right, and I, right. I did it right at the end. But you, can, you can reach Pokey's wife at that email address, find out more about the camp. And we'll also post this uh, email at our Facebook page for anybody okay. who is interested. Team Reese 18 at yahoo.com. Thanks a lot, Pokey. Appreciate it. Thank you, Bruce. Pokey Reese, former Major League standout with the Reds, Pirates, Red Sox, coming to Hall of Fame May 26, 27th, and 28th. We thank Pokey for being so generous with his time. Thank all of you for being with us as well. Have a great day, everybody. Take care.